You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Radio Public, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for September 20th, 2019. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from Cornfield Resistance Headquarters, where whistleblowers always drink free, it's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Hi there. Hello, darling. How are you doing today? Ugh. We've been, ra- <laughs> we've been racing past each other all day and all week, really. So. Oh, gosh. And, and the news is just so shitty. Are you referring to getting crushed at Harry Potter trivia? Because Well, we I did agree. that, that was- too. That was a tragedy. We let the side, we are the side and we let the side down. So Lord, we, it's, not... it's kind of weird. Cause a couple of weeks ago we did trivia and it was just general trivia. Yes. And you know, stupid crushed. shit in your head. And we crushed them. Cause we're our head, our heads are collectively full of stupid shit. They're full of stupid shit, right. but specific Harry Potter yes. trivia with people who come into trivia in their, you know, Team Slither- Ravenclaw Slytherin shirt. t shirts. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Oh, so this not is not for it. the casual observer. No. And there were, I, I would estimate, I'm, I'm not good at this. I would estimate there were over 3,000 people there yesterday. Is it was about packed right? and it was hot yeah. and it was crowded and noisy and yeah. hard to hear, hard for an old lady like me to hear uh, the questions, although that didn't really prevent us from getting them wrong. <laughs> so. Right. And the saddest part was that the team next, there's a swapping process. You trade answer sheets with, with the team near you and you grade each other and right, keep each other on it. Right. And, and the, the, uh, the uh, youngsters next to us were like taking pity on us going, it's okay. We'll give you partial credit. Like, no, no, I do not need your pity. Okay. Come back in two weeks when the topic is classic science fiction from the 1960s and I will blow your doors off. Right. But for now, right. I'm just enjoying myself and, and reveling in the fact that well, I mean, this is a room of 10,000 readers, which is yeah, awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's really great. Yeah. A bunch of people read a whole bunch of books and remember them. And as a writer who would one day like to, you know, make a living at it, uh, I think that's all to the good. It is. So, it mm-hmm. is. And speaking of writers, yes. I want to do early in the show, I want to do a shout out to three authors who listen to this podcast, have published books, and have sent us copies. And I have put on, if you just Google Blue Gal, my blog comes up. And at my blog, I have links to these three books in in order by uh, last name of author, just like in the bookstore. <laughs> Robert Chaz Shute sent us another uh, book. I don't know how he does it. He just turns them out. And he's a good writer. He doesn't uh, blog his, every day is what he no, does. No, <laughs> that's what he does. He doesn't blog every day. He writes books. <laughs> Uh, yeah. His latest book is called The Night Man. Uh-huh. You know, your father has been kidnapped. What do you do? And Ernest Easy Jack uh, has gone back to his old hometown and his father has been kidnapped. So this is an adventure story. Uh, and I'm looking forward to reading it. The next one is by Brent Michael Kelly, who is from Wisconsin. Good for him. He uh, has written a book called Cruise Roosters, which is, uh, it kind of seems kind of cyberpunk. I haven't gotten too deep into it, but uh, back of the book, it says uh, there's a person named the Prophet King who runs the world and also runs a game called Cruise. And then there's Molly Most, who is going to be the greatest Cruise broadcaster ever. Mm -hmm. There's a nightmare future lying in wait in this book. And so, yeah. Is it some sort of science fiction? It is. It is uh, clearly futuristic, and uh, there's some sort of machine or helmet or something in the game. I, I'm looking forward to look to uh, dipping into this one. The uh, book cover uh, promises a little bit of fighting, so <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I'm looking forward to checking it out, though. Uh, and the final one is Famine in the Bullpen by Julian S. Taylor who is a veteran of Sun Microsystems. And he is making an argument in this book for uh, more innovation in tech. Now that sounds like, wow, you know, do we not have innovation in tech? But he's arguing that 
I'm down to one button on my phone. Okay, just so you know. There's no more buttons. They can't be reduced any further. I have one button. That's all. But he is arguing that in the pursuit of coding, that we are losing our ability for innovation in tech. And that's a fascinating argument to make. Um, if you are at all in any way involved in software engineering, famine in the bullpen is something you're going to want to pick up and take a look at. And I'm gonna, I used to. Yeah. I mean, yeah. three careers ago, that's what I used to do. And I, I used to be very good at it, as a matter of fact. And uh, I'm, I, I plan to read that uh, with great interest. Yeah. I'm not, this is not a diss to anyone else, any of the other fine authors who sent us books. This one, however, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. I, he's I get, he's getting into the, the politics of the workplace and, you know, stuff yeah. that he's been doing all along. All of a sudden his boss comes in and says, we must be doing this. Our competitors are doing X, right. Y, and Z. Why aren't you doing this? And it's like, yeah, we've been doing that for three years, that kind of thing. No, that's the wrong answer. The right answer is, I'll get right on that, boss. And then on, on, a day later, turned you it, have three months worth of innovation. And work like, oh, my God. I couldn't have done it without your inspiration, boss, really. I couldn't have done it at all without your motivational speaking, standing behind me, sweating on me, telling me to do my goddamn job. Right. right. And then you keep your job as opposed to saying <laughs> – Get the fuck out of my office. Or what? How dumb? Oh, I see. This is what unemployment right. looks like. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, do you mind if I just read Robert Ches shoots letter to us no, no. right away? Because he did include a letter. We've I've also been corresponding uh, with both uh, of the other authors, with Julian Taylor and with Brent. Brent is a sweetheart. Thank you, uh, Brent, for all your kind words. Um, but uh, I'm just so proud that our podcast listeners yes. are writing books. It's yes. just, it's like I'm beaming right now with pride for all three of these guys. Thank you for the work you do in keeping the written word alive. And by the way, all three of these books really appear to be proofread as I dip into them. I don't find yeah. any spelling errors or any, any uh, you know, bad diction it's it, they've they've done their work so you guys are great you had to rub really it in, proud of you look out you just you had to rub it <laughs> well, in yes I, i'm not I, rubbing I, it in you know i do i do typo checks on your pop your yes, blog you post it's all about me <laughs> it's all about me honey remember whenever you're talking about authors it's all no i'd love to hear robert uh Robert's robert letter. cheshoot writes from ontario hi bgdg a couple more books for you one is mine oh and the other one he sent Science yeah. fiction trivia. Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh, your class is loving that one. That, that, it, it, that with a did, retro he cover. Didn't write, that he didn't write it, but it, it is a science no. fiction trivia book. Yeah. Uh, Here's a bag of cocaine. <laughs> Would you like some? Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. I was divided into parts and there are tests you can take. Yes, I would like some more. Thank you very much. Uh, a cup, uh, One is mine and the other speaks to how much I miss science fiction university. You will not be missing it for much longer. We have... We no. almost have episode one in the can, and uh, we yes. know we need to get rolling on this. We are behind. Uh, listening, here's what Robert Chaz shoot continues. Listening to your podcast reminds me of an anecdote. It's my favorite story, and it's at the heart of all my stories. A student went to the principal's office to advocate for a classmate who was disabled. She was trying to improve access to school resources. The principal was unmoved. Looking for an excuse to do nothing, he replied in a dismissive and condescending tone, you have to learn that life isn't fair. The student replied, and you have to learn that it's up to us to make it that way. Yes. Robert Cheshute continues, I know it often feels like institutions are crashing beyond repair. Under the current administration, some have lost hope and many more have lost more than that. However, surrender gets us no further than failure. Resistance is the only option. Things are bad, it's true. In fiction, no matter the crime or the apocalypse, I always try to offer readers a sliver of hope for the future. You and your podcast offer that crack of daylight and the gulp of air we need to continue the fight. Chop wood, carry water, Robert. Thank you very much, Robert. We, yeah, we, he's a writer. He is. Yeah, I, writer. first time I read yeah. that, I was like, "Yeah, okay, you're you yeah. you get it. You yeah. put words together for a living. We get it." 
<laughs> yeah, you got a pretty <laughs> mouth there, Robert. You got a... <laughs> he is a good guy, and we appreciate the kind yeah. words. It's it's uh, a we pick do. me up to hear that 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 yep. we make a difference. I'm sorry. We also had coffee with uh, yep. listener Steve this week, and thank you so much for the tomatoes and everything else. It's all appreciated. Oh, tomatoes from his garden. Oh man, so good, so good. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, we, we bought our way out of the coffee shop. We ran over and we bought our way out with fresh tomatoes. They were like, they're delicious. We we enjoy them. Our vegan at home is it loves them. And we're going to cook them up special tonight. Oh, I'm sorry. We also had dinner with one of your colleagues. We did. We had dinner with Heather. Mm -hmm. Heather from Crooks and Liars on Thursday night. And uh, she took us out and we had a great time catching up with her. We did. And uh, she has been the heart and soul of the video well, and, and it's it's not just, I mean, we've we've met Heather several times before, but mm -hmm. it's a reminder that these seemingly big and, and legitimately influential institutions on the left mm -hmm. um, are actually come down to a handful of people. Yeah. Just working their ass yeah. off every day, all day, on the weekends, getting up at six in the morning, know who, knowing who every blonde idiot is on Fox by name and being able to sort of cross-reference that is the job of a person. A person is doing that. Yeah. An individual is doing that. And it is exhausting work, and it is not rewarding in, in the traditional sense, but it's necessary. And we really do appreciate the hard work Heather does on behalf of Crooks and Liars. Well, and I really kind of had to hang my head. We're, we're jumping right into news now. But I found out today that in the process of writing a post about Candace Owens, who yeah. Republicans brought before Congress they to did. testify that there is no white supremacy, white no. nationalism. That's like, you know— on the very bottom of my list of priorities for black America, let's talk about how black men aren't men and black women are getting too many abortions. Let's talk about that. You know, that mm -hmm. was really her thing. Well, and she was there because Lee Atwater is dead. So right. they didn't have <laughs> so, and, anyone. And they need a young, pretty African-American uh, stooge to, to say what they want to hear. Right. And she provides that for money. She does. And for money. For money. For That's, money. She does this for money. For let's, money. And uh, she was uh, let go from Turning Point USA no, uh, really? earlier this year oh. because she, she tried to say, you know, well, you know, Hitler wanted to make Germany great again. Yeah. And she said that in front of an office, uh, in front of an audience in London, and uh, it got her in a lot of trouble. But the the conservative memory hole is very yeah. wide. It's very generous. And she's back again. Yeah. And she's going to be speaking at a conference for Turning Point USA oh, that's uh, on nice. black leadership. That's nice. Now, the headliner for this conference, Drift Glass, is a man named Charlie Kirk, who last time I checked... I've heard of him. ...was not black. No, but he is a relative of James Tiberius Kirk. <laughs> and in the future, he kisses <laughs> Lieutenant Uhura on the mouth... <laughs> And therefore, by the law of something, something, corollary, something, he is legitimately a future black person. He's in the considered past. a black person in the Black Leadership Conference for yeah. Turning Point USA. Yeah. You know. So I went over to see how much they were charging for this conference because, you know, you've got to make money for Candace Owens, got to well, get paid. And really, only one of us can afford to go, Blue Gal. So, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll flip a well, coin. Well, if we were under 28, we could all go. Really? Because Turning Point USA is providing travel vouchers, oh. free hotel rooms, and some meals. Wow. For anyone between 15 and 28 who wants to attend the Black Leadership Conference. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because Heritage Foundation is co-sponsoring it. That is uh, so, terrifying. Yeah. And uh, let's face it. Um, you know, the Volkssturm, the, the, the folk army that the Germans mm -hmm. threw into World War II at the very end, old men, yep. little boys. Yep. yep. Um, Candace Owens is their Volkssturm. Mm -hmm. They have they have nothing left. There's no Char – Charlie Kirk and Candace Owens are the vanguard of the conservative the intellectual, intellectual vanguard movement. of that's the how, conservative movement. Absolutely. That's how utterly bereft they are. And and they know that no one in their right mind under the age of 30 is is a conservative. Nobody. Right. There's, I can't think of anyone who who would think of a reason other than being raised in that family. Now we have friends who were raised in in conservative families, who were raised in evangelical families, right? Um, who found it really hard to break away from those, and mm -hmm. they have relatives who are still that way. But there is nothing in their future. 
There is no future for the conservative movement. Now, if you are a filthy old man, like most conservatives are, you don't, you don't give a shit about that. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you're going to be dead. You don't really care about the future. Who gives a shit about kids? If you gave a shit about kids, you'd be a Democrat. So, but the younger ones, and by younger, I mean, you're 30, 40, 50 years old. They need the next generation. And ain't nobody and they're willing coming to pay for it. They're willing to, to pay to for bribe it. them here. Mm -hmm. Please. We'll give you money and food and shelter to come to our conference to hear Candace Owens and Charlie Kirk blatting on about the horrible lefty leftist Nazis that are trying to take your freedoms away. Except for and, Hitler, who's, right. you know, trying to make Mayor Germany great again. Again, <laughs> that was just too, that she being too right too soon is yeah, you know, they yeah. have the style book. And if you get outside the style book, there can be penalties, but they're, they will always welcome you back. They will always open the door back and let you back in. The only thing you're not allowed to say is the left was right about the right all along. That's yeah. the unforgivable sin. Everything else, easily forgiven and forgotten. And believe me, they forget really fast. Yep. yep. We'd also so, like to uh, send a shout out to uh, our, our brother in, in, in trouble. Uh, the Rude Pundit is mm -hmm. doing a hard time in Twitter jail. Um, I have uh, taken on the task of smuggling his missives, his uh, manifestos, if you will out to the world uh <laughs> and uh look dude you've got all this time on your hand why don't you get to blogging buddy you know that's yeah. you know Blog you got... and do another podcast yeah mm -hmm. we'd love to my... we'd love to hear you again yep <laughs> my my notes yeah well that's <laughs> that's yeah the every now and then podcast with the real hundred <laughs> with um, <laughs> i um, didn't know but... he's busy but yeah. guys my first advice and to everyone and this is not unique to me other podcasters no. have said the same thing yes Yes. If you're going to do a podcast, it's got to be every goddamn week. That's yes. it. Uh, same, preferably same date, same time, same right. day, same time. Right. Um, but it really, you do have to be completely consistent or people just, you know, tune it out. Um, but I, my notes from the Twitter ham jail, uh, yes. was some of my very best work. <laughs> um, I think I inspired a whole generation of, of older white idiots to oh, um, shoot their mouth off on Twitter <laughs> and call people things. I, but remember, I went to Twitter jail for calling Bill Maher a whore. Yes. And uh and and saying that they should send out the gimp with complete with graphics. Yeah. Uh for for Lindsey Graham, yeah. which is a quote from one of the most famous movies in modern American history, yep. Pulp Fiction, and entirely appropriate. So you will go to Twitter jail for no reason. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're standing next to a guy who's next to a guy. Um and the one person who will never go to Twitter jail, of course, is Donald Trump, and he is the worst single offender of every norm in human history that we currently have on display. I believe you were going to talk a little bit about No More Mr. Nice blog. Is that true? Just for a moment. I just wanted to to do a shout out on one particular post he did this week, yes. which spoke to me. Yeah. And there are several. He also he wrote up David Brooks this week, uh, as, no. you, as you did. I, I, and I have not written up David we will Brooks get yet. To I, couldn't, I couldn't. I couldn't. I was just... Oh. Uh, I you know. couldn't. Well, he but wrote it up to. for us. I'm then. obliged to at this point. It's It's the law. <laughs> You are really obliged to. It's it that is an incredible It's just uh, so bad column that and I mean that in the incredible of I can't yeah. give it any credulity because I do not understand how someone gets paid well to do that and pretend that it's either entertaining or informative. I just I don't I, I'm I I'm have my theories really and you'll see them in a blog that. post sometime in the next seven to ten days. Yes. Very good. But uh, no more Mr. Uh -huh. Nice Blog. Steve M. wrote a post this week entitled, Why Can Republicans Be Radically Out of Step with Public Opinion While Democrats Can't Be Moderately yes. Out of Step? And uh, part of it is about Brett Kavanaugh and part of it is about just politics in general, that the way things are framed uh, is... Republicans can just go full insanity. Right. And the media just goes, well, that's, you know, that's one side. Yeah. But the Democrats yes. are equally bad. Yes. Or can is Elizabeth Warren electable? Is she electable? What, is she smile enough? Yeah. Oh, crazy oh. ideas. In the meantime, you've got <laughs> you've got Jim Jordan on Hannity saying, Whatever the president says, it's what's best for America. Right. Just don't ask any questions <laughs> about anything. Everything is under he control. He has blanket immunity for life. Do you right. understand? <laughs> right. That's that's the law. That's just that's, the law. You can't. <laughs> and 
people on cable news reporting that Trump's lawyers said, you can't investigate the president at all. Ever. No sitting president can ever be investigated. Yes, for anything. For and anything. Do, do, they, do they remember that Hillary no. Clinton's Christmas no. card no. list had a 10-day no. investigation? No. Of course. Well, they don't care. No, that's, that's, that's the, the it. Point, yeah. I, I'm going to try to swear off, don't they realize? Yeah. Because it, you're dealing with a sub subspecies of politics that doesn't comport with sentient, normal adult behavior. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with monsters fucking monsters mm -hmm. and trying to reason with monsters and, and try to talk them out of being monsters is inevitably going to fail because they're monsters. This is who they are. Jim Jordan is a fucking monster. Donald Trump is a monster. Lindsey Graham is a monster. Mitch McConnell is a monster and you're never going to trick them or persuade them or flash a mirror up and say, don't you see what you look like to other people? They don't fucking care. And that's the, this is the great liberal trap is that we keep looking for a way to, to trick them into admitting publicly that they're monsters. So like, no, I'm a monster. Would you like me to take my pants off and wave my dick around? Well, here's Corey right, Lewandowski right. to do just exactly that. What happens to Corey Lewandowski after he comes in front of Congress, after Democrats make fools of themselves trying to pretend that he was a witness to be dealt with like a normal adult human being. Uh, and then he got beat down by an actual lawyer for 30 minutes. Corey Lewandowski takes a break in the middle of his hearing to announce mm -hmm. his Senate run because that's the only reason he's there. Remember, there's two empty chairs. The other two clowns they invited didn't even bother to show up. And Corey Lewandowski takes his dick out, waves it around for four hours, then goes on CNN the next day to do exactly the same thing right. because they put him on the air at CNN. That, and so it is – I'm not – I'm not – leveling this at anyone in particular I'm, I'm saying that i am personally exhausted with people on my side saying don't they realize of course they realize right of course they do and no and you you did you did do a post this week about how jeff zucker is as bad as roger ailes yes jeff zucker is if you want to direct your personal and professional ire at someone if you want to level um the charges of of who fucked up our democracy Roger Ailes is near the top of the list. Uh, Jeff Zucker is a close number two. Mm -hmm. Jeff Zucker is the president of CNN, and it is by his blessing that all of this shit happens. The Corey Lewandowski is put on television. The Corey Lewandowski was ever a CNN contributor. That that Rick Santorum is was, is a regular on that shitty network. This Jeff Zucker cares about money. He is a truffle hog for money. Mm -hmm. He does not give a shit about anything else. He he created Donald Trump on The Apprentice. He made Donald Trump a rich man. Donald Trump made Jeff Zucker a rich man. They jerked each other off right up until he went into the White House. And then Jeff Zucker suddenly was shocked at all the horrible things Donald Trump was, and then, then made ratings bank on it ever since. Mm -hmm. Jeff Zucker is a horrible person and a monster, and, and he, but he doesn't fucking care. And there's no one on his network who's going to mention this. There's no one on MSNBC who's going to call him out because all of them are terrified that one day their resume will be sitting on Jeff Zucker's desk. And he'll remember, remember when you called me a monster just because I wrecked American democracy? Well, I guess you don't get the fucking job, do you? So if you would like to make someone your poster child now that Roger Ailes is dead for who screwed up American democracy, I would nominate Jeff Zucker. Because without him, Corey Lewandowski never gets on to CNN the day after the hearing. Mm -hmm. And he never was a person to begin with. Corey Lewandowski got fired <laughs> by Donald Trump for being an incompetent fuck-up. And he abused a female reporter. And he lied constantly. He was a third, fourth, fifth-tier thug. And yet now he is sitting in front of the House Judiciary Committee just waving his dick around. Uh, because he knows he can't. Because there's, there's no consequences to this. So uh, one of the things that we try to do on the show is to provide a vocabulary for our listeners to discuss with their friends and neighbors about politics. We also want to emphasize the importance of unpacking words and vocabulary that is being thrust at us, which is uh, there for a nefarious purpose. Mm hmm. And what we mean by that is the lifeboat builders, particularly we find them very easily on Morning Joe. Yes. Uh, yes. Who want to pretend that Donald Trump's not a Republican and that Republicans are basically good people and we can discuss things with both sides and so forth. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, this this week on Morning Joe, there's been a lot of talk about tribalism. Oh, tribalism is the new word, Luke. It's the new hot word. It's the new dumpster fire, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it's there to replace both sides do it because mm-hmm. both sides yeah. do it is now a punchline. Thanks to frankly the professional left. You're welcome, America. Yep, and also uh, I I mean I'd fully take credit for just for destroying the both sides argument. But uh, Donald Trump also shit on that by saying both sides oh, yeah. at, at Charlottesville. So well, eventually, eventually the gum loses all of its flavor because someone chews out the last little bit of it. And he did that. But yep. he, what he did there was expose uh, what a colossal lie. The both sides do a, a lie has always been. This is the mm-hmm. this is the shelter under which um, the Craven Beltway media has been hiding for 20 years, 15 years at least. Um, the, every time there's a Republican catastrophe, every time there's a Republican atrocity, they run to the safe shelter of both sides do it. And if I can take one minute of privilege, uh, I would like to thank, um, the, the lads over at pod save America, Uh uh, because today on their podcast, I'm quoting John Favreau. Now I do listen. I, I sort of skim, but I listen. Republicans know if they scream and insult and yell at people, then the media won't report that as Republicans are screaming and yelling and insulting people and turning it into a circus. The media will report it as both sides are at fault. And that was on the Pod Save America podcast this very day or whenever it was recorded. I am deeply grateful and genuinely grateful that they are catching up to where we were 20 years ago. Um, I'm not being facetious. I'm saying that that's great. That's progress. We're starting to get people with large media platforms or larger than us uh, saying this stuff out loud, which they would never have done two, three years ago. Yeah. To hear them haranguing the establishment Democrats about not taking a tougher line with the insane clown party using exactly the same language we were using to harangue them when they were in the Obama White House about not taking a tougher line with the insane clown party. <laughs> like, okay, well, I'm glad you're catching up. Um, great. Now, wherever you're going to go with this, I'm all for it. But in my nightmares, it's like, and next up, let's ask Rick, Rick Wilson about his new book and about how fucked up he thinks the Democrats are. Yeah. I'm happy that people are catching up to where we've been. I truly am. I am deeply frustrated that they never seem to learn that lesson until they're out of power or retired or too late. Well, and I think we're, we're engaging in a little bit of selective memory too. Uh, Mm -hmm. Barack Obama did try on more than one occasion to call out Fox news by name. Yes, he did. And got hit back with such a powerful hammer. Right. For even mentioning anytime he mentioned it, it made the beast stronger. Right. And I'm not talking about Fox News. No, I know, but but mm-hmm. I think there there was a um, longer game being played in the Obama White House, uh, mm-hmm. if it, at especially in the second term. Yeah, where, I agree with that. Where he's not going to get anything done anyway, because Mitch McConnell's going to stop everything, and so he became uh, a royal figurehead. I'm I'm going to say it that way. He be, yeah. Barack Obama became. Uh, someone who was the ambassador uh, for the United States worldwide. Mm-hmm. And uh, is and that is one reason he is beloved by millions today, is he, he stayed positive. He moved, you know, out into the world and met with school children. And, and when there were crises, he handled them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, his behavior and ten- tenor at... Sandy Hook will never be forgotten. Also true. Uh, and that was a choice that he made. He could have fought the battle that we are still fighting today with the media. Mm-hmm. He could have chosen that battle, and that would yeah. have been great. But I think he conscious. I think that was a conscious choice that he, that was not his battle. That well, he didn't want to fight that one. I, I, and I'm not going to disagree with you. I'm going to uh, revise and extend my remarks <laughs> uh, by suggesting that if fighting against Fox News is a waste of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, no matter what you do, it, the beast will get stronger. If you if you fight at all against, if you push, unless you push them in, into the ocean, um, it doesn't really matter. Roger Ailes, you know, killed over dead, and they're still going strong. Right. So there, it's it's a machine. It's been set up to operate as a as I used to call it the pretty hate machine, and it works. It's on autopilot now. There's no stopping it um, except by internal collapse. 
What? Well, and and by going after their advertisers, and that is right. oh, that yes, is absolutely. working to a certain extent. That is working. Uh, but the, the what the Obama administration could have done and did not do um, is stop courting the good opinion of David Brooks. Yeah. Stop trying to please George Will, and start telling your people who are on the Sunday shows back when you know they would be invited to participate in in the Sunday morning ritual that when you get on these shows, ask harangue chuck todd or harangue david gregory or harangue george stephanopoulos remind them it isn't goddamn both sides and you damn well know it's not just do that and don't try to beat fox you're never gonna do that but you could have at least dispatched your people into the um into the both sides do it media that's not fox news that is abc cbs nbc too much of msnbc cnn um, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the the mainstream media adopted this both sides do it bullshit um, back when the Bush administration collapsed. And they certainly carried through during the during the fake Tea Party era. You could have said that Tea Party is a fake. It's a Republican uh, put up job. There's no Tea Party. It's just a bunch of goddamn coward of the Republicans who are too afraid to take ownership of what they did during the Bush administration. Could have done that. You could have said, Chuck, you know, you goddamn well know. David Gregory, you goddamn well know it's not both sides. You damn well know it's Mitch McConnell. You damn well know it's it's Rush Limbaugh. You damn well know it's Newt Gingrich. And and the left is simply trying to survive an onslaught of fascism from the right. They could have done that. And the thing that, that triggers me in this way, if you'll pardon my use of that word, is that these were the people who were writing speeches in that White House. They knew this was going on. This can't be news to them. They were living it. And so the idea that we'll, we're just not going to mention that the media is a shithouse that rolls over for Republicans every single time because, well, I guess Hillary's going to win and then we'll just be back in the same game again. But Hillary didn't win. And this is what really does bother me is I want to see my allies step up when they have the biggest possible baseball bat in their hand to take on the people who are enabling the destruction of my country. And they just, like the Democrats right now, I'm right with these lads from Pod Save America right now. The Demo the establishment Democrats right now are just pissing me off. Mm -hmm. You know, brows are being furrowed, blue gal. Right. Stern letters are going to be written. Fingers will be wagged. And I just keep looking at them like, what, what more do you, who, what do they have on you? Right. I stopped asking what they have on Jim Jordan. What right. the hell do they have on you, Nancy Pelosi? What yep. is stopping you? What do you really want to go down in history as the only Speaker of the House to to take impeachment off the table twice for two presidents who richly deserved it? Is that what you'd like on the very first line of of your obituary? Because all the good things you've done, you've done enormous good. Is you look like you don't know what you're doing. You look like you're so afraid of taking on Republicans. That you're just going to sit back and, and keep saying, well, eventually and someday and one of these days. And that's where we get to this sort of the destruction of language. Yeah. Yeah. Because I keep hearing from them. Tribalism is, is again, the very big word. Tribalism is it was Oliver Morning Joe this week. It was uh, Sebastian Younger, Tim Carney, who has no business being on television, uh, Mike Barnacle, all talking about and Jim Mattis, all talking about the horrors of tribalism, which was a very... Uh, a, a very long winded way of not talking about Republicans. Right. It is. You know, it's just, <laughs> let's not talk about the fact that basically everyone here with one or two exceptions, our party is the problem, mm -hmm. but we're not going to say that because it's morning Joe and we don't say things like that. So we're going to say that tribalism, this sort of nondescript basic human condition. Yeah. You know what? Your tribe puts kids in cages. Mm -hmm. My tribe would like to have health care for people. Those are our two tribes. You're right. We are two tribes. And what you're trying to do with the word tribalism is remove any moral or ethical or, or uh, faith-based judgment from any position anyone takes. It's, it's agnostic. We were talking about this with Steve yesterday. It's, it's a font fight. Well, you know, the people on the right want to put babies in cages at 72-point font. The people on the left want to give people healthcare, 72 point font. They're basically using the same font. So basically they're indistinguishable from each other. The, the, the left and the right are basically the same. And they're basically hostile to each other for reasons that no one can understand. And the only way you make that argument stand is by never talking about the moral and ethical um, reality 
of the decisions being made on each side of the aisle. That's what they're terrified of doing. They're terrified of saying Republicans are bad people. The reason the Republican Party is fucked up is the Republicans are bad people. And they're never going to say that. So they're stuck using what George Carlin called the soft language. Mm -hmm. The language designed to obscure, the language designed to cloud, not to clarify, not to make things precise, but to, to, to definitely push away from them any discussion of who is right and who is wrong during any specific conversation. And so then we get into words like we and they, which. And can you I use that as an example of that? We and they. Sure. We need to stop letting these people. Okay. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> right there. Right there. Who the hell is we? Who are these people? And what exactly do we have to do with mm -hmm. that? Uh, this, this cropped up all over the place after, um, after CNN put Corey Lewandowski on mm -hmm. Is CNN a public utility now <laughs> that we all have a piece of and we all make this decision together? Because it's not because one guy named Jeff Zucker is making this mm -hmm. decision. Why aren't you saying Jeff Zucker must be stopped from putting Corey Lewandowski mm -hmm. on the air? As opposed to we need to. Oh, it shouldn't be allowed. This should not be allowed. Well, again, should. Yeah. Should, can't, and must were very big this week too. Must is a command word. It's like obliged or compelled. All right, who exactly is it that's going to compel or oblige CNN to not put lying douchebags on the air? Name names. Who, who, who has the authority to do that? Well, there's like five people. Why don't you call them out for who they are? Why don't you name who they are? Because it certainly isn't me or Blue Gal. It's, it's, so who are these people that have this authority to do this? And, and, and why must they do it? Again, you're commanding them. You're saying that they're under an obligation or, or compulsion to do a thing. Really? And all I hear right now it, from Democratic establishment people is what Republicans should do mm -hmm. and Republicans must do. And I really do ask the same people, you, you've got the big hammer, Nancy. Why must they do it? Or you'll do what? Because right now, going to Congress and taking out your dick and waving it around carries the same, con carries actually less consequence than getting kicked out of Chuck E. Cheese. Mm-hmm. And, there's, and the fact that you can go to Congress, you can blow off a subpoena, or you can sit there and lie, and nothing is going to happen to you, and everyone knows nothing is going to happen to you, guarantees that you're going to go through it all again, but worse. Every time you let these criminals get away with their crimes in public and laugh at you about it, you guarantee the next time they're going to come back for your purse, the next time they're coming for your house, the next time they're coming for your kids. And you, the only people who have the authority to stop that politically are House Democrats. And the only people that have the authority to stop that in the media are the presidents of the media corporations. Not you, not me, not us, not we, not everyone, not Americans, not both sides, not all the tribes. They're really specific people who have responsibility for these things. And the media is really, really interested in never talking about them by name or what their lines of authority are or who gets to decide whether Cora Lewandowski goes in the air mm -hmm. or not. And that is a big problem. That tells me that they don't. there's a whole portfolio of shit they don't want to talk about. And all the stuff they don't want to talk about is exactly what I love talking about, which is why I'll never be invited on CNN again. <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> hey, uh, Dirk Class, yeah. I want to wrap up this podcast with some hope. And the hope is our kids mm -hmm. and young people across the country who are engaging in a climate strike today. If you look at the pictures from New York City, it's as big as the Women's March, if not bigger. Mm -hmm. Uh, huge, huge numbers of young people coming out uh, demanding action. From whom? <laughs> from all of From their us. elected representatives. And that's... And from their elected representatives. And we had a situation this week, a very sad situation in our community, mm -hmm. where a uh, student at the high school where our daughters go... Mm -hmm. uh, committed suicide. And this is someone that they did not know personally. There's 1,200 students in this school, so it's a big school. And uh, we don't know all of the particulars about the situation uh, or the student's situation at all, really. Um, but our kids and a number of kids at this school uh, took action this week. They did a walkout. They did a demand to meet with school administrators. They talked to each other. 
they made sure that the administration knew that they considered mental health of the students to be something that was not being prioritized, Mm -hmm. that they did not feel heard, and that this was the result. And, uh, you know, the administration of the school and the school board and so forth are all making the right noises at this point because that's all that we've been able to have so far. Uh, the the walkout was Thursday, so they, there hasn't been a lot of time to react to it. But uh, certainly the, the administration didn't punish any of the students that walked out. They uh, called parents last night with a robocall to say uh, this was a student-led protest. We hear them. We are meeting with students, and we have social workers on staff who are meeting with students, and we're going to do more about mental health and so forth. So they're making the right noises, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And we can expect follow-up and action on that. But for now, uh, I I feel like they're doing, they're doing, saying the right things. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, But these student-led things uh, are really, um, it's becoming really clear to me that uh, this next generation knows we don't have time for a lot of bullshit. Yep. And that they're going to take the reins and that is in large part due to social media and their interconnectivity with each other mm-hmm. uh, to simply lead yeah, and lead and not follow. And they're not asking us at the professional Life podcast no. and they're not asking no. uh, Nancy Pelosi and they're not no. asking any member of Congress. They're, they're saying we're going to take the lead on this. And uh, that's exciting. It is. It really uh, is. It really is. It's exciting yeah. to watch, and it's it's a good thing. And it's in the face of um, cynicism that they're doing yeah. this, that anything yeah. can ever change. Yeah. That they're saying, no, we're just going to try anyway, you know, yeah. and we're going to yeah. succeed. And another bit of good news, as long as mm-hmm. that we're doing good news, um, Mitch McConnell will now be backing a measure to provide states with additional quarter billion dollars in election security funding. Now, is that going to be taken away from the Pentagon and given I, to the wall? I have no idea. <laughs> I, 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 but, speaking of cynicism, that's where my mind goes. Yeah. Well, is, I, you know, it's I, and I don't know if it's eleven dimensional chess. I don't know if there's a, a poison right. pill in there that oh yes, you you get to have the money, but you have to deport, you know, every sick child in America, right? Uh, who right. is not third generation American has to be you know cast into the ocean. I don't know. Mitch McConnell is one evil human being. But mm-hmm. there is something to be said for enormous amounts of humiliating pressure being put on one person on one issue without relenting at all ever for a minute. And it's Moscow during Mitch, a time when he is up for re-election. Yes, that's when you sweat. get them. Right, make him sweat. Right, um, right. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, I will note that um, there have been no professional or um, institutional consequences for a guy named uh, Brett uh, Brett Stevens. You might know him as Brett Bug, uh, mm-hmm. or losing his shit twice in the New York Times for declaring his inconvenience to be the equivalent of the Holocaust and then going on television saying the same thing. And then having his friend David Brooks write a column that essentially was subtweeting the whole thing in absolutely unhinged hysterical terms. It was an embarrassment. It was a week of embarrassment. It was it was clear that, oh, Brett is not only just an idiot and a nut, he is absolutely not not fit for this job. And doesn't know how to interact with human beings at all. He's not his, his political judgment sucks. His 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 uh, conservative um, credentials are terrible. His grasp of science is nil, and he is as thin skinned and prickly an aristocrat. And he's a terrible writer. And the consequences to him having all of that sort of spilled out in public are zero. Yeah, he's back and, writing and columns. The and- New York Times, if I may add to the pylon over the New York times. Please do. uh, Did some sloppy (laughs) editing last weekend. Yes, they did. uh, Regarding the Brett Kavanaugh book, which opened a door. It was, it was almost amusing to watch in real time. How, when the New York times fucks up, the right wing noise machine goes into full action and says, now see the whole thing is debunked Mm -hmm. because there's this one mistake. We now don't have to pay attention to this issue At all. We don't have to pay attention to new evidence at all because the Mm -hmm. New York Times messed up their editing. And that's not true. It is not debunked. There there is evidence. Brett Kavanaugh does not belong on the Supreme Court. He should be impeached, period. But but it was, as I said, was almost amusing to watch 
this editing mistake takes place and right away jumping into the fray the right wing defenders of brett kavanaugh saying and you see now we don't have to pay attention now he's totally exonerated by this editing error and once again we'll loop back to steve m at no mr nice blog yeah yeah. Why can Republicans be radically out of step with public opinion? Well, Democrats can't be moderately out of step. One mistake, one screw up is enough mm-hmm. for everything you've said, every everything everything that's hanging off of that issue. The entire Christmas tree can be thrown out and burned if one light is burned out. Mm-hmm. On the other side, it doesn't matter if you've made a bonfire that, that blots out the sun of lies. Uh it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. They don't care. And that is that is really, really something we all sort of have to swear an oath and promise ourselves and, and do a, a, a New Year's resolution in the middle of fall, um, at least for me, stop automatically wondering why do they get away with this? Mm-hmm. How They just do. They, that's This is not a curable thing. This is not something, again, you're going to trick them out of or they're going to come up with some elixir that will make them stop behaving this way. This is who they are until the grave. This is they, These are ride or die lunatics. Hey, uh, go Greta Thunberg. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the youth will, will move forward. And she had a very profound thing to say this week, which was, let's do this radical thing and let nature take over the parts of the planet yeah. <laughs> and, and fix this. You know, if we allow nature and plants... To grow, mm-hmm. it will improve things it, dramatically. Crazy. Did you see her, was her classmate? A young man, I don't know, maybe 10 years old, um, mm. was standing with his arms outstretched to protect her from the paparazzi. Oh, wow. It was so sweet. It was so sweet. Wonderful. I don't want to offload my problems on to that generation and say, well, you guys got this. You know, we're, right, we right, still are, right. we are obliged right. to do everything we can as often as we can with whatever energy we can to, to give them a better world than we got when we were kids. Absolutely. No, um, that's a good, very, very good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I really do feel mm-hmm. that if these are the voices that will be governing the next generation, will be speaking for them, that this is how they will be thinking, that we are in much better hands than I thought we would be. Well, and this, this relates to something that I've known internally for a long time mm-hmm. as a member of Gen X, <laughs> yeah. which is, uh, I remember being in an office where my boss was about, you know, eight years older than I was and had everything. I, I mean, just her college was already paid for her. Uh, she had already inherited a house. She had just this incredible amount of wealth and privilege. And it was the accident of being born in the fifties right. as opposed to being born in the sixties was just, mm-hmm. Night and day. Remarkable. Mm-hmm. A remarkable difference. And here I was paying student loans and, you know, working for her and so forth. But I realized in sort of dealing with her, and she was a difficult boss, that not having money eventually made meant you don't care about money because <laughs> you're never gonna have it. <laughs> and so yeah. when you don't care when you have that liberating feeling of, okay, I'm never gonna be rich fuck it, I'm going to do, I'm going to go and pursue justice yeah. for other people. Or I'm going to look down and link yeah. up. Yeah. Right. I'm going to, or I'm going to be an artist and I'm going to, but I'm going to do that thing, that humility thing that we talked about last week. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make it, my values are, I'm going to lead with that. I'm going to lead with my values rather than mm-hmm. pursue wealth. Yep. And this younger generation has been cheated out of so fucking yeah, much. Already they have. And But they're fearless. They are. Because of it. What are you going to (laughs) do? Take away my Uber job? Fuck you. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And I'm going to go into the streets and I'm going to make sure that you hear my voice. Mm -hmm. And that courageous, goddammit, fearlessness, Mm -hmm. all of us need to cultivate that. Indeed. uh, And and get there. And uh, I want everyone to know how much we appreciate the support that you give this podcast. We really do. We really do. Ah, oh, how you doing there, darling? Oh, I'm really <laughs> melting down now cuz it it hurts to have to worry about money. It does. It really does. It hurts, mm-hmm. but um I am so grateful to have the intellectual and technological tools to do this and uh to have all of you as friends of our podcast thank you 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, can I tell you a different story about Gen X and me? Sure. Um, it's the opposite of the one you told, but um, <laughs> but it, it's a learning story. And I, I probably have told it on this podcast before. Since we are at 512 episodes, it's likely I've told this once before. A um, long time ago, this is seven or eight careers ago, I, I used to teach technology um, for a corporate training company in the loop on LaSalle Street in the loop. And I was there for about a year and the owners were just terrible. And then they were replaced by really, really awful people uh, who just started firing people. They started firing people they didn't like because they were minorities. They started firing people they didn't like because they were uh, women uh, and didn't look right. They started rearranging people's schedules based on just atrocious stuff, punishing people they didn't like. Their goal was to purge the place of everyone who didn't look the way they wanted their instructors to look, no, no matter how good they were. And mostly they wanted white people of a certain age to work there. And I used to uh, give rides home to some of my younger colleagues. And when this started, at least a couple of my younger colleagues said, but you can't just fire someone for no reason. <laughs> like, oh, kid. Oh, kid, do I have some bad news for you? Oh, hell yes, you can. But at some point, um, they had become possessed of the idea that the, the world was fair. Someone told them at some point along the, the road, but one of the rules was if you just do your job and do it well and stick to it and show up to work on time and, you know, and, and be professional, you'll be safe. Yeah. And I had to break it to them. No, that's just not true. Um, affirmatively, your employer cannot fire you for a protected category, uh, but you have to prove it's it's on you to prove they fired you because of your age or your gender or your sexual orientation or faith or what have you. Which a lot of places, um, sexual orientation is still a fireable offense. Yes, we're but not there no, yet. It's, yeah, this is this is not the workers' paradise. Right. This is this not it's not fair. Your employer can fi fire you because they don't like the way you part your hair. Mm -hmm. And th this look that came over them, which was just sad and dumbfounded and and speechless, that you're kidding. No, that's. That's capitalism. Yeah. That's the system that works. That's where this is how everything works. And that's why you have to be, you know, you have to integrate that knowledge into how you deal with the working world. Because the working world um, is not interested in playing fair. The world, the working world is interested in extracting the maximum amount of value out of you for your labor. And the people in management are interested in having a company that looks and sounds and reflects their values. Yep. And oftentimes their values are horrible. So that is something that really took them by surprise, but they learn from it. This is one of those sort of hard lessons that when I used to teach, um, teach at Columbia college and used to help run their academic community department, I would have to give sort of informal lectures on the real world, you know, capital R capital W because the, the the young men and women were full of myths about how the real world worked. And mostly it was just, oh, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way at all. Um, when your boss wants it Tuesday, you're going to get it to him for Tuesday. And if that means you have to work there 24 hours a day and work yourself to the point of exhaustion, he doesn't care. Yeah. Well, and now now the country has a boss that wants you to not investigate him. Right. And that exactly. that's the part where all of us sort of sit there and go, you really can't do this. And the only right. way we get there is if our elected officials stand up for the norms and institutions mm -hmm. that have kept this country going. And well, uh, I am frustrated and uh, we, we will get there, but we have to make our voices heard. And well. Yeah. And I would add that. I'm trying to end on a high note, Drift Glass. I know. Uh, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, let, me, let me put it this way. Most of the places where I've ever worked, where the bosses ran the place as their personal fiefdom mm -hmm. and had terrible values, right. uh, are out of business. Right. No, that's true. <laughs> that's true. You, can't, you simply cannot sustain a business, a profitable business, uh, when you piss off all your best people, drive them out the door, mm -hmm. and set it up to to reflect your per unless it's Fox News, uh, <laughs> which is, you know you have a sexual petting zoo set up by Roger Ailes right. because he he was a creepy, weird, old degenerate. But other than that, most in, in most cases, eventually the incompetence of senior management simply collapses, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there's no way to prop it up or lie your way around it or pretend otherwise. We had the collapse happen during the Bush administration. 
and the Obama administration came on and did the things they did well and did the things they did poorly. And I hope we've learned a lesson from that. This administration will collapse. Yeah. Don't know when, might be tomorrow, might be a month from now, whatever. I'm, I'm confident that the people I know and the people of the next generation have learned that lesson now. It's yes. in their bones. Yes, I, they, I agree. they now know we can never, ever, ever, because the Bush administration was a dry run for the Trump administration. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we cannot let this happen again. There cannot be this, lifeboats. This has to be. They are exactly. complicit. And the next president, the next Democratic president has to take no prisoners yes. when it comes to this kind of bullshit. No, Mexico's going to pay for it. No, you can't investigate the president. Don't you remember? No. Donald Trump's lawyers told you, you can't investigate mm -hmm. a sitting president. And the media has to be forced to remember that on air. Yes. Yes. And I don't care if you stood up to corn pop uh, <laughs> back in the day, back in 1954. <laughs> That's great that you did that. I'm, I'm proud of you back in the day. But I want to hear how you're going to break the back of the Republican Party and force the media to start behaving like an honorable fourth estate again and not, we're all going to work together. It'll, magic's going to happen. Mm -hmm. We're all going to, no. I want to hear a real clear uh, plan. I want to hear that you understand the problem. Right. And I want to hear that you have a way to solve the problem or a strategy for dealing with the problem because then a miracle occurs is what the Obama administration kept yeah. Ba yeah. banking on and it didn't work. So we need better than that. And I think we deserve better than that. And I think we're all geared up to hear better than that. And yeah. whoever comes up with that message is going to find an enormously responsive and supportive um, group of Democrats yep. from ages 18 to 80. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Hey, each week yeah. we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitties are Dexter and Charlie. Dexter and Charlie are brothers and they are 16 years old in this picture. Damn. Uh, Charlie just got back from the vet and the vet said, Charlie may be 16, but he looks nine <laughs> and he acts three. So yeah. that's kitten math for you. Uh, go visit Charlie and Dexter at our Facebook page or website. And remember that Charlie and Dexter, of course, eat freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the cat food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service Go, Postal Unions, letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job and a labor of love. And if you cannot afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, uh, you may consider listening to us on Radio Public. They actually pay us by the listen. So that yeah. is one way that you could support the podcast if you really are unable to afford to uh, support us with a contribution. Uh, listen to us on Radio Public. That will help. Thank you. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution. You can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you for doing that. Hey, Driftglass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Lou Gal, the Internet Kitties are wondering how to get their $5 back that they sent you the bill to Blasio's Super PAC. Let's think about living. Think about living. Let's think about loving. Think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, lovey dovey. Let's forget about the whining and the crying and the shooting and the dying and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018.